On either side the river lie, Long fields of barley and of rye, That clothe the world and meet the sky, And through the field the road runs by, To many-towered Camelot, And up and down the people go, Gazing where the lilies blow, Round an island there below, The island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver through the waves that runs forever by the island in the river flowing down to Camelot. Four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. By the margin, willow-veiled, slide the heavy barges trailed by slow horses, and unhailed the shallop flitteth, silken-sailed, skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand, or at the casement seen her stand, or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers reaping early in among the bearded barley hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the reaper weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening whispers, tis the fairy lady of Shalott. There she weaves by night and day a magic web with colors gay she has heard a whisper say a curse is on her if she stay to look down to camelot she knows not what the curse may be and so she weaveth steadily and little other care hath she the lady of shalott and moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year the shadows of the world appear there she sees the highway near winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue the knights come riding two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights. For often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows said the Lady of Shalott. A bowshot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The jemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see, hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot, and from his blazoned baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue, unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still Shalott. His broad, clear brow in sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war-horse trode, from underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as he rode, as he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira Lyra by the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the watcher lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume. She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse is upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott.
In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in its banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat, beneath the willow left afloat, and round about the prow she wrote, the Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance, with a glassy countenance, did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day, she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light through the noises of the night, she floated down to Camelot, and as the boat head wound along the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song, she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here, and in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space, he said, she has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace. The Lady of Shalott. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam. When that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our born of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. And seemed as if they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess' cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandeloff chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whate'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, t'was all one, my favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. The white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling, even had you skill in speech which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one. And say, just this or that in you disgust me, here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth and made excuse, e'en then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. 
Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed with much the same smile. This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you to rise? We'll meet the company below. Then I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together, down sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. The rain set early into night. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite, and did its worst to vex the lake. I listened with heart fit to break. When glided in Porphyria, straight she shut the cold out and the storms, and kneeled and made the cheerless great blaze up, and all the cottage warm. Which done, she rose, and from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl, and laid her soiled gloves by, untied her hat, and let the damp hair fall. And last she sat down by my side, and called me, with no voice replied, she put her arm about her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare and all her yellow hair displaced. And stooping made my cheek lie there and spread o'er all her yellow hair, murmuring how she loved me, she too weak for all her heart's endeavor to set its struggling passion free from pride and vainer ties to sever and give herself to me forever. But passion sometimes would prevail, nor could tonight's gay feast restrain a sudden thought of one so pale for love of her. And all in vain. So she has come through wind and rain. Be sure I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud. At last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell, and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and all her hair in one long yellow string I wound. Three times her little throat around and strangled her. No pain felt she, I'm quite sure she felt no pain. As a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily oped her lids. Again laughed the blue eyes without a strain. And I untightened next the tress about her neck. Her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. The smiling rosy little head, so glad it has its utmost will, that all it scorned at once is fled, and I its love am gained instead. Porphyria's love, she guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard. And thus we sit together now, and all night long we have not stirred, and yet God has not said a word. Thanks for stopping by. Nothing enhances cognitive abilities, increases vocabulary, or expands horizons more than reading. Be sure to check out my other videos in this Lit in 10 discussion series.